on part SM, welcome to part 3 of our Model Hero 112 Ferrari 250 GTO video build. Yes, so we're finally back with part 3. I've been beavering away uh, this past week trying to get this video part out. Uh, very eager to work on it myself. I'm also getting a bit anxious that I'm not getting as much content out as I should be. Been a few issues lately, computer computer problems, um, just things going wrong, no internet, um, the Mac died on me, all sorts of stuff going wrong. And it's put an absolute just kibosh on all the videos. And I'm working through, trying to get more out there. And I've been very anxious to get this part out to make people know I haven't forgot about it. And I am massively enjoying still working on it as well. So... Today we're going to get all the front end suspension, running gear, steering, braking system all uh, cleaned up, soldered, primed, painted and assembled and finally get that huge engine on that chassis as well. So without further ado, let's get on and let's get cracking with the video. Okay, so we're back with part three of the Model Fat Hero Ferrari 250 GTO and again we're back with some sanding. Sanding and filing. We've got my Tamiya basic files on a selected um, part list that we've um, previously sorted in previous videos when we went through the tumbler, went through the instructions, and separated everything out into their appropriate sections. So in this video, we're going to try and get all of the uh, front suspension assembly, including the brakes, uh, suspension, obviously. Um, and the pedal box and try and get the engine mounted in as well so there's quite a bit of work to do including hours of filing and sanding which i condensed into a couple of minutes for you um, so like i said we use our tamiya basic files to just deal with the basic um, seam lines that are all over the white metal and then we'll clean it up to a slightly better standard using our ump 240 gray sponge which does work wonders on the white metal and brings it back to a much more appealing finish. Um, now, we are going to solder quite a lot of parts today, uh, mainly these two large front sections of the uh, subassembly uh, on the front of the uh, suspension. Chassis is resin on this, and it is going to be a bit mm, precarious later um, because of the weight of the engine and the flexibility of the resin. It's very, very precarious it is you'll see what i mean later on it's definitely a point of concern for later um because that engine weighs a lot and the resin flexes a lot with the engine on but we'll see how it goes and fingers crossed it'll be okay but we're going to clean up all the seam lines there's literally seam lines across the whole chassis so this again was another hour or so probably two hours of sanding uh, it was at least a day of clean up here getting all these parts cleaned up it is dirty, messy work, even though the parts have been through a tumbler. Once you start filing and sanding and drilling, you end up getting covered in the fine powder of white metal. So gloves is a recommendation. So there's at least two, three hours worth, at least half a day of um, sanding there to do. With the uh, parts temporarily assembled for the front subassembly, uh, we've clamped them together. We've put some uh, low temp um, flux on there and with some 70 degree low temp solder and our weller iron which is set to about 150 degrees centigrade we're gonna slowly go around and carefully solder this part together so by just touching it with some solder on the tip the capillary action instantly melts um, the solder into the join if you just run it down it allows it to flow nicely without melting the white metal and we can get a nice structural um bead of solder in there and then we can sand that back and end up with a nice flawless finish on the uh, the part so while this is a bit more time consuming than um super glue it does look a lot better and is structurally stronger as well which on parts like this is quite important so get yourself a good iron get some nice low temperature solder look for the gauge master stuff and there's also a larger bar on amazon as well low temp solder it's not cheap you don't get a lot for your money but this bar will last you a long long time uh good soldering iron is capable of um, being adjusted for you know 120 180 degrees centigrade 
uh, and some good quality low temp um, flux. And the flux I've got is called, I will tell you now, DC Concepts Flux. It's Sapphire No Clean Flux for Hobby Soldering. So that's what I'm using. And like I say, get the flux on the parts, get your temperature on your iron, get some solder on the iron, and you can literally just run it down and let the capillary reaction carry it into the gaps. It's nice and satisfying to do. Like I say, it's not necessarily the quickest way of doing it. Just put a few dabs of Sago on there is a lot quicker, but this is going to look a lot neater. It's going to be a lot stronger. And it's a good part of the build process as well. But you have to learn how much solder it takes. As you can see, I just put a little bit more on, and it flows beautiful. And I find just running your tip up and down, sounds absolutely disgusting, um, will let the solder flow really nice and into the gap like so. So just keep the temp constant at a temp you're happy with and don't let the iron linger too long on the white metal because as we know from the Lancer video, the soldering iron will destroy the parts very quickly. Like I say, we're just trying to get the structural bond. This will all be flatted, filed back and sanded later. Quick word of warning on these parts. I assembled these parts without thinking. There's two holes at the bottom. There's four holes each side to drill and it's where the uh, suspension arms are mounted in place. I didn't drill the bottom two um, because this part was in place. I then had trouble drilling it later on. So make sure you pre drill all the holes. I think one of the things with Model Fatty Hero we always say is test fit, test fit, but you will always still find holes that need drilling later on after you've painted or committed to soldering. So on this one, make sure you drill all four of those holes that are for the suspension arms because, uh, yes, it made it a little bit more difficult for me. So on this, we've got a couple of points. We're going to just solder this section here. We are, of course, making sure all the parts are as straight as possible. This one was bent in a touch, so I just bent it back out a bit. Then on the sides, I'm going to hold it, and I'm just going to use the soldering iron to get a bead of solder in, and I'm going to push it back slowly because I can't get the iron in there fully, and just hope that the heat and the flux carries it in, which it did. There we go. It's got that in. Like I say, we can always clean it up later. And you can always clean the iron up as well. And run it over the top to smooth it out later on. Like I say, we're just trying to get it structural for now. We'll sort out how pretty it looks a little bit later on. So, like I say, it's satisfying doing this. It's actually quite good fun. Um, just obviously be careful you don't burn yourself. Um, make sure that you've got maybe a fan on to blow the solder smoke away or the fumes away from you because you don't want to be getting breathing those in. We've got some very fiddly parts here that need a cleaning up, drilling and soldering. So we've got the proxon out. This is where things start to get a bit messy as well. I'm just going to drill the holes. Now, another word of warning, the drill hole sizes in the instructions, I would drill those sizes to begin with, but I found nearly every one needed at least 0.2 mil uh, higher, uh, wider of a drill bit. So where it was calling for one, it was 1 1.2, 0 0.8 needed one. But for the beginning, I would definitely go with the recommended drill size, and you can always just slightly ream the hole out later on. So we've got several components for the pedal box. This is quite tricky to solder. So I tried a few different ways for doing it, and the easiest way for me was to get some white tack, pop it on the bench, push the part in, get them roughly where needed, get the flux in place, and then use your free hand to hold while your other hand does the soldering. And all you need to do is do a quick bead, hold it in place, and then you can move around to the other side and get the pedals in place. And again, hold them gently. The solder dries almost instantly with a quick blow. Quick blast of air from your mouth or other or orifices. Orifices? Orifices? Orifices. will uh, quickly dry the solder. So it's quick and easy to work with. And then, like I say, if you're quick, nothing will move. You can get everywhere else soldered too. But it's by far the easiest way and the um, the neatest way of joining the parts. Um, but it is a bit more time consuming. But it definitely does look better. So I would highly recommend the soldering. And I thank Jamie uh, for putting me onto it. And Alan Parker for the help in uh, selecting all the iron and the, everything needed. So yeah, it's definitely a skill I'm glad I've uh, added to my repertoire.
And I just wish I had it for the Lancia. I really do. As you can see, drilling out makes the bench absolutely filthy. Really does make a hell of a mess. It's all over my hands. It's all over the bench. Um, my new cutting surface here is actually now a silicon uh, cooking mat. Not cutting, cooking mat. And it's working very well. Even with all this white metal mark all over it, once you've cleaned it all up using a wet piece of tissue, a bit of UMP airbrush cleaner on a cloth will wipe it off in a second. It all wipes off. Uh, the only thing I do find I have a problem is drilling holes in it, which I found out very quickly. Don't do that. It doesn't like that. Um, but I've had Supergo on there. I've used Acetone to clean it up with no marks left behind. Lacquer thinner doesn't bother it at all. And uh, This cost me £10 for basically an A3 size work area, which is what I work on anyway. Uh, was it A2? Might be A2 actually thinking about it. And um, yeah, it's working out really well. You can get them on Amazon, really cheap. And uh, yeah, I'd highly recommend it. They come in all different colours as well. And it's proven very well. So we've got some smaller parts here. We're just going to hand drill these because they've got tiny, tiny 0.5mm holes in them. And then with my Haynes 250 GTO, a very kind gift from Jamie B to Christmas. Uh, it's a good reference book for the 250. There's lots of pictures of actual cars. There's some great pics around... Um, uh, Nick Mason's 250 GTO as well. Some good reference. And like I say, on parts like this, this thing needs a bit of structure to it because it is one of the parts that connects to the steering. Um, I opted to just take a punt and solder it in place now, uh, hoping that I got it in the right position. And thankfully, I actually did. I found just get it 90 degrees to the other part and make sure it's straight inside. And what I found was if you solder it on one end and it's not quite straight, if you just push it into place, it will break the solder seal, and then you can re-solder and get the strength again. Got some ProScale X Primer here. We sell over at ProScale.uk. Uh, this is perfect primer for white metal. It's made for priming burr metal. Actually chemically etches to the burr metal, so it works absolutely perfect. With my uh, Iwata Revolution 0.3 at about 20 PSI, I'm just going to put a couple of light coats on. Working our way around slowly. On the bigger parts, make sure you get all the nooks and crannies. But this is by far the best primer for burr metal, especially white metal, because it chemically etched itself into the actual part itself. And we'll come back later and give it a prime in black before applying our colours. But as a good precaution, I use this on all my white metal now and photo etch, and it's working out very, very well. So head over to www.proscalepaints.uk. And grab yourself a bottle of this. We do a photo etch primer as well. As well as any paint colour, custom colour you'd like. And we've got a range of, there's about 50 odd paints on there now. That we're adding to constantly. You can come over and have a look. With that all dry, uh, it leaves to dry for a couple of hours. We can come with some Mr. Service of 1500 black. And give everything a nice light coat of black. Uh, this is in preparation for, it'd be LP5 on some parts. And metallic colours on the other. So just a couple of light coats. We'll do the job fine. We're through the Iwata Revolution 0.3 again. And the uh, Mr. Surface is thinned about 50, 60% with Mr. Hobby level and thinner. Goes down really nice, nice and smooth. As you can see, covers really well over our etch primer. Absolutely brilliant. Good stuff. I'm a big fan of Mr. Surface there. It's great stuff. Of course, we do our own primers now as well, but they're more suited as a microfiller um for our bodywork more than anything so uh still use mr servicer for smaller bits like this definitely works out better for me right yeah quick clean of the airbrush and um a day later because i forgot to prime this uh we've got the chassis so literally finish what i was doing in the booth Sat it down at the bench and spotted this. And I was like, how did I miss something that big? So this is the following day. And we're going to put three coats of this onto the resin. Uh, the resin's been cleaned as well, obviously, because you get release agents on the resin. So give it a good clean with some uh, pre-paint cleaner from ProScale. Uh, as you see, I've got a couple of Bulldog clips holding the bottom. And all I've done, once one side is done, is remove one. Then hold the dry piece, remove the other. And prime that area as well. And there you go. Hey presto. Easily done. It's a big part of prime. It isn't the strongest piece of resin either. 
like I said before, I am quite worried about this and its structural rigidity with the engine in place. But we're going to have to just go with it and see what happens. But once the engine's on it, it is very, very wobbly. But fingers crossed, it'll be okay. There we go. So everything is painted up. Um, we've done anything black here is LP5. And silver is a combination of um, stainless steel and iron. So I'll call them out as we see the parts. For the pedal box, I'm just going to paint in Vallejo uh, Model Air Silver. Just going to brush paint the parts it's called out for in my uh, color call out. The reason I'm using this rather than enamels is I want to put a wash on this. And the enamels play havoc with uh, the washes. So I opted to use this nice flat Tamiya brush. Just carefully paint everything up. Dries really quick. It's not the most hard wearing of paints, but it does work well. On all the steering joints, uh, we're leaving the ends in um, Stobby Super Metallic Stainless. And we're brush painting the centers in Vallejo Model Color Black. So they can all be done, leaving the turnbuckle uh, connections there as well. And we'll give all this a wash later on to add a little bit of depth to it and break apart that monotone metallic look that we have here. So thinned with a drop or two of water, the model color goes down really well. I've been using this for years and it's a very, very good color. Same for the spring cups on the suspension arms as well. We're just going to brush paint it. You could sit and mask all this off if you wanted. It will take you longer to mask than it would to paint everything. So it's sometimes not worth it. And the brush painting, as long as you use a good quality paint and don't go over the same part too many times, it dries nice and smooth anyway. Um, so not a problem using it at all. We've got the space circle cutter now. What we're going to do is we're going to make our circle template uh, the right size. You can see I've already test fitted a few that weren't correct. And we're going to mask, mask off the central hub on the brake disc and spray it black. So the space circle cutter is an expensive luxury. I'm not going to lie. And yeah, don't let your little blade fall out. That's really annoying. Um, but it's a very good circle cutter. Now, as you'll see here, I've made this ever so slightly too big. It's like a millimeter, fraction of a millimeter too big. So best thing to do is just put a little snip in it. And that way we can just close up the gap all the way around. And that'll do us for masking. And then that's given a couple of coats of LP5. And that will be the center hubs done. So like I say, that the space circle cutter is an expensive luxury, but it's one of those tools that when you use it, you're glad you've got it. I've got all the circle cutters, and whilst they're good, they're nowhere near as accurate and precise as this, nor are they as easy to use. And my two alpha cutters that I bought because there's two sizes paid well 30 odd 40 pounds when this cost me 50 pounds. So, yeah, it's one of those. Do I think it's worth the money? Yes, do I use it a lot? Not particularly, but when I do, it's a completely invaluable tool. And there we go. There's the hubs masked off. Like I say, we give those a couple of coats of LP5. In fact, I think I want Mr. Service of 1500 black on them for a different color. We're going to start assembling some parts now. So we've got our Bob Smith Super Gold black there. And just start assembling bits as the instructions call out for. Like I said, all the screw holes were too small. And also, the screws for the steering knuckles were too short. There were three mil screws, and it left like half a mil protruding. Luckily, I had some longer screws left over from my bike building days. So, I had just enough to remedy this. So, I made the holes wider and longer and deeper, and screwed them in place on the top and the bottom, and got a much more secure fitment. I'm using my Tamiya screwdriver just to screw these in. And there we go. Much better, much stronger uh, fitting placement. And like I say, every hole needed widening. Every single one. So I would recommend drilling the sizes requested. And you can always make them a little bit wider later on. The arms for the suspension, they just slot over. And there's rivets in there. So I found get them in place, get the rivet in place, pull it out a little bit, put a little bit of Bob Smith's on the end, 
and then push it fully home and that way it doesn't interfere with the movement because these suspension arms do move a little bit there is a little bit of movement in them i'm not saying the suspension is going to fully work but as you see we're just going to pop the rivet in place and then a little bit of glue don't need a lot at all these precision tips are invaluable if you ask me for this there we go Put that in place like so, and there we go. Repeat that for the other side. Once we get our spring in, these were painted in LP5. So get the bottom in and then repeat for the top. And obviously repeat that for the other side as well. So it's pretty straightforward. It's quite tricky to get everything to line up, but it's not too bad to do at all. Whether it's all gonna sit straight is a completely different matter. We'll see about that. Uh, we're assembling all the steering joints here now as well. These are particularly tricky. Very small screws. Not a lot of area to screw into either. So this takes quite a bit of care and attention. So be nice and gentle here. Like I say, don't get too hung up on them moving. If you start moving them around, it weakens the joint. And I think you're going to end up losing um, the hole, if that makes sense. I think the hole is going to get too big. Sounds perverse, I know. And you're going to lose the screw's ability to actually grip on it. So what I did is I test fitted everything, then I assembled it all as a unit, and then we're going to pop it all in as a job lot. So this has all been test fitted. I know it all fits in place. And I put a couple of dabs of Bob Smith's in the locator points at the back here. And then we can push that side in. You could also put these on first and try and screw everything in, but I think it'd be really awkward to do. So I opted to do it this way, and it worked out quite well. The Bob Smith is good here because it gives you a bit of time to work on the parts, uh, and you can also get the parts off for a couple of minutes afterwards. It doesn't grab instantly like some of the CA glues. Um, obviously, it does if you hit it with a kicker, which you'll see me do from time to time. As you can see, there we go. That's all in place. It looks okay. Whether we're going to sit straight, we're not going to know until we get the wheels on. And we'll deal with that when we come to it. Paddle box. Now, in your instructions, you've got the options for A, B, and C. We're doing option C. So, ours is left-hand drive. So, the pedal box goes this side. Look on the other side. There is an also a locator point, And it comes with a little blank like this. So, if you're building the other versions of the... Uh, sorry, right-hand drive. If you're building the left-hand drive versions, you can then switch it around and have the pedals on the right side so quite nice little touch this so just pop that in and a little bit of square kicker there we go job done there we go there's a little frame at the back a little white metal frame you're going to see there you see on the bench that we're going to pop in place as well so the key to the top on either side just slots in perfectly and then locate at the bottom like so there we go and then onto our brakes so there's our mast off hub that we did earlier we've got the rear section that sits in the back with our caliper carrier there the caliper slots over the disc it's a very tight fit which is quite good to be honest and then there's two locating points on that carrier at the back as well so they've all been drilled out uh, previously uh, again i found they need to drill out a little bit wider than recommended i'm just going to line everything up like i say test fit everything before you commit to anything test fit everything you can and then there's some very tiny rivets these are very fiddly to pop in place we'll get them in and then as a whole unit it slots over there and i just put a nice generous helping of CA glue on there just to get a grip of it you see I am quite generous here because it's going to have to hold this quite well and there's not a lot of surface area to get it on and then I just grabbed it got the caliper straight where I wanted it and then got the hub straight with the uh, disc in place as well it's not the best fitment I'll give it that but it doesn't look too bad so we've got the engine test fitted on the chassis. 
it's a big lump of an engine for this small piece of resin. I am generally concerned about this, so we'll see how this goes. Um, the chassis has been drilled out, and I'm just test fitting the bolts that go through. There's four of them, two at the front, either side, and there's a, a hole at the back for the locating point. And I'm just going to test these and realize, like a moron, I haven't drilled them out. So, yeah, there you go. Now I've got to manhandle the whole engine and drill out all the holes. So, again, test fit, check everything. But it's so easy to miss the, the, um, the holes that need drilling. It's so easy to miss them. So we're just drilling it out, being careful not to wreck all our previously done hard work. A quick test fit shows it all sits perfectly. Uh, we're going to put some of our cheap, generic, thick CA glue on, a little dab. That will not only grab the engine itself, but also grab the bolt as it goes through. And our RC stand coming in great use here. And we're going to pop it in. We're going to get that real low mountain point locating mount in place. First of all, and then try and lay it in so we can work on it. Like I say, this engine, it weighs like 380 grams or something. It's really heavy and it's a massive lump. You can see how huge this engine is now on the chassis. It's a big lump. It really is. And it's a case of getting the bolts. I think screws would have been beneficial here. I'm not going to lie. I think screws are beneficial. Now, the instructions do call for putting this engine in before you get all the chassis parts in at the front. I think it's easy to do the engine last, personally. So it's up to you what you think. But this engine is a monstrous unit. It is huge. It's definitely going to be a good showcase when that bonnet's open. It is very, very cool. So put a little dab of glue on the bolt itself. And then pushed it home, give it a sec to dry, and we're going to repeat that all round. And what I did on these areas here, because the exhaust manifolds are right in the way, was just get in there with our Bob Smiths and then slide the bolt head in there with it. And there we go, it's in place. But oh my god, is that quite a sketchy fitment on there? It's a lot of weight of a huge part on some pretty precarious resin, but that is one impressive. V12 engine and it looks absolutely phenomenal in this chassis. It looks really cool and it's so nice to get to this stage. I've been dying to get to this stage for a long time and at last we have. So there we are. That's the engine in, the front subassembly, all the suspension, uh, some of the running gear, the brakes and what have you are in place. I think the next part we're going to work on is start some assembly of the body. And there we go, at last, we've got it all mounted up. Very happy to get to this stage. Um, a lot of work, a lot of hours of cleaning up, a lot of hours of soldering, painting, all condensed into a nice little neat 30-minute video. Um, unless you've worked on these kits, you'll never appreciate how much work it takes just on clean up alone. Uh, they are a very, very involved kit, but very rewarding at the same time. Um, so, yeah looking forward to cracking on with this i think the next step for me now is i'm going to start work on the bodywork i'm going to get the shell cleaned up i'm going to get the bonnet and booth fitted the doors fitted get everything done there get some primer on the body get some paint down on it and go from there still not 100 percent sure what i'm going to do yet i don't know how to do the graham hill car with the blue nose whether to go with a road car but i don't have the exhaust for the back i don't know what to do i'm really on the fence here if you've got any ideas yourself let me know I do want to do a Rosso Red. It's a Ferrari 250 GTO. They should be Rosso Red. Um, but I'm thinking more road car. I don't like the blue nose of the Graham Hill car. Or I just do my own what if. And we just keep it red. Chuck some roundels on it. Have the side exit exhaust. And it's kind of my bastardized Franken Ferrari. I suppose we'd call it. I don't know. But yeah, it's my model. I can do what I want with it at the end of the day. I just don't like that blue nose on the car. It looks odd on a red Ferrari. So, yes, I'm not 100% sure. I'd like to hear your views. If you've got any comments, pop them down below. Uh, and like I say, we'll be back soon on this. I've got other commitments to do as well. I've got a load of reviews I want to get. I've got a bench update I want to do. A new build I want to start, the Hasegawa Ferrari 250 TR. I'd like to start as well. 
Um, but I'm looking forward to getting to the bodywork on this. And it's going to take a lot of fitment to get the bonnet, boot, doors, and other components to fit on that as well. But looking forward to getting to that because it's my favourite stage. I do enjoy the bodywork stage of a build. And uh, it'd be nice to crack on and get some paint down on this. It really will. There we go. At last, we got this done. Um, so, yeah, there we go. That's it. Um, as always, like support me. Keep the videos going. There's a Patreon me down below. There's all perks associated with it. You can get all sorts of early access, exclusive videos, um, exclusive chat on Facebook, exclusive messenger group, uh, live streams. And without your support of the monthly patrons, I couldn't keep doing this. It is massively important to keep you guys happy. And if anyone's thinking of becoming a supporter, come on over, come and join us. And uh, yeah, you can help me keep these videos going for the foreseeable future. If you've noticed in the reviews, we've got an AC Cobra in the Model Factory Hero stash now as well, which looks amazing too. Uh, so looking forward to building that at a later date. Probably next, to be honest, actually, I think. Um, so yeah, there we go. We're really looking forward to getting back to this. Got a few other things to work on in the meantime. Uh, but we're back to this lickety split before we know it. So there we go. Uh, make sure you check out the links down below. There's links to everything down below. ISM, UMP, ProScale Paint, uh, the live show stuff, the off-air hangout. There's my stash, my Amazon store, email address to get in touch with me. All the products I use are listed down there in two separate links on Amazon and the forum as well. And of course, make sure you give the video a thumbs up. Click that bell notification to get notified of all the latest videos. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well and leave a comment. I love reading on your comments either on Patreon or on ISM. Let me know. There's about a two week early access on the videos at the minute. It is going to go back up to a month as I add more videos. Uh, if you'd like early access, become a patron and you can get instant access as soon as all the videos are uploaded. There we go. Thanks for watching, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye bye.